next lecture uh, on the techniques with make what's the mathematics, some really elegant linear algebra uh, to these uh, to these uh, physical Feynman-like things that we've been describing so far. So the next lecture uh, on uh, Thursday, this is Tuesday, the 22nd, if I got my uh, fourth dimension right, <laughs> uh, we're going to take on uh, the sort of weird things that I'm going to leave aside here. I'm going to only consider today matrices that are non-degenerate. But I'm going to consider some pretty uh, funny looking things like, we're going to just take on this matrix right here. This is a really cool one for describing uh, the theory of projection, which we need to do group theory the way we do it. So you can take a matrix like this, one, two, three, four. In fact, you can take a matrix with random numbers in all four places and make a theory of bras and kets that's really elegant. And then be able to take any function of that matrix. That's, that's what we want to be able to do. And we also want to be able to, to take several matrices together and diagonalize them. That's what's called reducing a group representation. So we're really learning the, the, the basic techniques, the gearing, the machinery that we're going to use uh, to reduce group representations and classify them. And that's what the rest of the course is about. But this is the, the key piece of linear algebra that's just left out of all the books I know of. It's really a tragedy that it's missed. Um, mathematicians that teach linear algebra, like Mark Arnold in the math department, is familiar with it. He hasn't emphasized it enough. Uh, and and uh, the physicist here, I, I very seldom do I find one that has, has heard about this. So, uh, we'll be taking on more complicated matrices uh, on Thursday. But today, pretty much I want to just do this guy. But I want to do it from a geometrical point of view. I want to be able to visualize uh, what it means uh, to have an eigenstate. And, uh, uh, an own state. Uh, Eigen is German for my own or something uh, like that. And uh, I want to first tell you how uh, an analyzer uh, should have uh, something like that. And then later we'll prove that. And then uh, this stuff right here, this is the heart of uh, the kind of mathematics that uh, Hamilton, Cayley, and other people uh, worked on. And there's another mathematician named Sylvester that actually uh, was involved in all of this. And then what we really want is the spectral decomposition of a linear operator, but in particular this little fellow right here is going to get the treatment today. And uh, the DTRAN, that's a diagonalizer transformation. That's something uh, people try to jump to with skipping over this. Well, you shouldn't because you get this thing for free. So let's begin here and uh, just discuss own states. We've been talking about uh, analyzers that transform uh, a polarization or, or a spin state. Uh, they're the same uh, mathematics, uh, the spin state being Stokes vector, uh, if you're talking about uh, polarization like we are. Uh, in any case, here sits a vector, uh, it's a cartoon of it. This thing happens, and the vector's somewhere else. So that's what's been going on uh, in uh, our little uh, demos, demos that we have. Now what I want to do is find uh, certain states that I could feed into this, uh, say the E state here, that would come out in the same direction, so to speak. That is, the vector would be, except for an, a factor, the same. So these are states that are invariant, in a sense, uh, to action, uh, but not quite invariant. The uh, analyzer is probably going to attach a factor. Our analyzers will be attaching a phase factor. They are unitary uh, analyzers, so that's all the uh, eigenvalues you can get. But anyway, that factor is called an eigenvalue. The state, a mathematical object, is called an eigenket. We're going to be able to derive the eigenbras by this technique of, uh, as we're doing the eigenkets. So it's, it's powerful in that sense as well. So this is the physical definition of the 
uh, eigenstates as far as our analyzers go. Now, this is supposed to be true for analyzers that do three, like Feynman's book, or four, five, six, seven, uh, no limit, perhaps uh, even a continuum, although we, we know such things are, are troublesome. But in any case, I want to do the geometry of this. The idea is that if you have um, a matrix like that, that's a pretty simple matrix, one, a half, a half, and one, and uh, I have a bunch of vectors sitting here that are going to get acted on by that matrix, uh, these are all going to uh, change their place, they're going to change direction. All but two of them, this one right here and that one right there, are still in the same direction. This one at 45 degrees is still at 45 degrees, but it got longer. This one right here is still at 135 degrees, but it got shorter. So there's a matrix that has uh, eigenvectors and eigenvalues very clearly in a geometrical sense. I came with this tensor, that's really well, what the T would stand for here. That's what a matrix really is uh, representing you see, and that tensor has literally crushed and pushed on those two vectors, uh, epsilon 1 and epsilon 2, while it moved all the others around into different directions. And they're all going to end up on an ellipse. That's something we, we should remember uh, is going to happen uh, with a matrix like that, which is called a positive definite uh, matrix. Okay? But their possibility is they end up on hyperbola. Or they don't change it all except for five phase and go with complex numbers like we're doing. Uh, that would be a really simple case. But this is a good uh, example to get used to the geometry that happens uh, when you apply uh, a, an operator Sorry. to a bunch of vectors, in this case a two-dimensional array. Sorry. Does that make sense? Doesn't change, doesn't it, this uh, operator change the direction of vector? It changes the direction of all vectors, yeah. except two. <laughs> those are the eigenvectors. And those are the eigenvectors that we're looking for. Yeah. Does, it, does that, that make sense? Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, you could really say that the matrix changed all the vectors in the sense that uh, the ones that it didn't are a set of measures zero. <laughs> I mean, they're just points. They're, they're very special points. But of course, they're the very important ones. That's that, uh, making sense. I mean, this is th this is a kind of visualization that so many students will go through a, a course in linear algebra or something and not have. Yeah. And it's really important to have. This is the difference between Feynman and the other guys. That he had this. Okay. Now we're going to push this a little bit just for the fun of it. Uh, okay. The idea is that the two vectors in the upper half plane at 45 degrees, basically, these lucky vectors are the eigenvectors of the matrix. This guy, and it doesn't matter what factor I put on him, whatever factor I put on him just multiplies over here. That happens, I have them all be unit vectors, and then they turn out to not be unit vectors after the transformation. Okay, so this is this is a a, a problem we're, we're going to solve. I'm going to do one, two, three, four, and find that you know what directions didn't get changed. Eventually, here it's going to take a little bit of time to say some other things. Okay, so that's the transformation for them. Very simple. T of epsilon one is just epsilon one times its eigenvalue, which is one and a half. And then this guy right here is also staying in the same direction, but it got shorter. It's, its eigenvalue is a half. So they suffer a little, but they don't have to change their directions. <laughs> okay? Occasionally have eigenvalue one. It doesn't change at all. And all the vectors that are going through our analyzers essentially have eigenvalue one. It's just a complex phase. <clears throat> Okay, now normalization is a condition to 
you know, separate out all the possible eigenvalue re relations because you see uh, th this equation would be true even if this thing was a hundred uh, units long. So we're, 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 we're in the unitary business here uh, keeping that uh, the same because we have a probability definition that would be, look funny if I had a probability of two <coughs> or uh, imaginary or something like that. Now, circle to ellipse mapping, this is uh, do this thing back and come, and come back, make this thing sort of balanced. I'm going to brush through that one a little bit, but I, I just want you to see this. This is uh, something that uh, is so important in the underreaches of relativity and, and classical and, uh, mechanics. Uh, and it also, I think, is, is important for uh, quantum mechanics for that reason. But, uh, each vector on the uh, left-hand ellipse here is going to map back to a vector in the C collection here, circular collection here, okay? So uh, the inverse of the T operator that got us this ellipse is going to take you back to a circle, okay? That's each C having a unit length. And you can see why it has a unit length, because if I do a scalar product, the I get a t minus, and I got a t minus two right here. T is a real, it's this real symmetric matrix. That is giving me the equation for this ellipse. So this is a, a way that I can see that I'm getting an ellipse. Now it's an ellipse that's tipped up, so I have to get my coordinate system up there in order to see the kind of ellipse x squared over a squared plus y squared over b squared equal one that you're used to. But what we call the general ellipse equation is a quadratic form. So this is a quadratic form right here. We've got this matrix, which is the double inverse, square of the inverse of the matrix that went this way and turned the circle into an ellipse. This is the one that sort of undoes it and gives me an equation. One equals the scalar product of R with the inverse to the second power and the uh, scalar product again on the right uh, with the same xy, the vector r, okay? So you know, these little connections here are, are very important because most of mathematics in the 1700s, 1800s that was uh, uh, interested in looking at polynomials and their roots and their behavior, uh, there's a, a, a you know, real history to, to these uh, quadratic forms and it still isn't done yet. In any case, you write this in the uh, coordinate system of epsilon 1 and epsilon 2, you're going to have just those uh, uh, numbers 1 and a half for epsilon 1 and 1 half for epsilon 2, the eigenvalues. Okay? So, writing the, in that would give you an equation for an ellipse. Very obvious high school equation for an ellipse. x squared over a squared plus y squared over b squared equals 1. So far, so good? I actually have a question. So yes, go ahead. So, um, so the definition that you have there for the k, uh, yeah, this one, uh, above. This one. Above. Oh, still. The ket, uh, this yes, one. Yes, there. And uh, so you are applying them on the bra. And that you are making an assumption on t. You bet. Uh -huh. You bet. Uh, so for this, this is a symmetric matrix mm -hmm. and real. Okay. If it was one of our U's that we've been talking about so far, uh, we would have to use dagger here. But if I use dagger, I've got a whole bunch of other dimensions that I got to worry about because it's complex numbers now, and we're really dealing with four dimensions. Right? Yep. Four real dimensions. This is keeping us uh, into the real range and just doing algebra. Yes. 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 Is that? Yes. that yes. come through? Yeah. And the inverse, as we talked we talk about, it. Oh, that's the dagger for unitaries. These are a subset of unitary operators. Yes. Very, the real unitary is orthogonal. And we'll have eigenvectors that are 90 degrees. We'll prove that later. So, if you have any, uh, you're looking a little puzzled, yeah. let's make sure that uh, 
Yes. In that T is not unitary, just its Hermitian. Yeah? Am I right? Oh, yes. The, 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 when you say you have a Hermitian matrix, that means it's uh, invariant to transpose complex conjugation. Mm -hmm. Okay? So it's the uh, T, okay, um, and a star. Okay? And a T and a star becomes a, a dagger. You put the star in the center if you're if you're a, a good Christian, I guess. Okay, and so you get a dagger, and that's the uh, Hermitian transpose, which is to do the transpose of the matrix, and then if there are any complex numbers, to change i to minus i. We don't have any of those, so all I do is flip here and make sure the matrix is the same. Nobody has a symbol for doing it the other way. Uh, there is reason for uh, studying that, but we're not worried about that uh, right now. But anyway, that's that's the, the key thing. And then uh, Selvo's question had to do with a, uh, with a T operator and its inverse here. I would have a dagger on that if it was unitary. And I'd be right to write a dagger there <laughs> because it's all real. Okay. Now, you can play this game circle to ellipse, okay? And then you can find an operator. Uh, this is just playing games, but we, we can use this game, okay? And this is something I say, I'm gonna go through this pretty quickly. I'm not gonna uh, take any questions on this. I just want you to see this, that I can have uh, a, a mapping, you see, that will take an ellipse to its conjugate. This is something that, um, we'll make use of later. This is a duality that's all over the place in physics. It, it, it's sometimes hiding so you don't see it, okay? Uh, we basically have an, a square root eigenvalues now. I'm using a, 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 a quadratic form that gives me uh, one right away, uh, and the vector p is a, a mapping uh, uh, to q, so I map from this ellipse to this one, or back again with M inverse, okay? And what you discover is this very beautiful tangent normal uh, relationship. Any vector here makes a tangent line that is perpendicular to the vector that belongs to it over here, and then that tangent line over here is perpendicular to, to this vector. This is something that's really, really cool for uh, things we're going to do later on. But it is uh, the uh, relationship between the Lagrangian and the Hamiltonian when you're talking about um, just a plain old uh, velocity space versus a momentum space and two balls running into each other in the dimensions this way and that way. Uh, that's the way I start mechanics so that you get used to this. So you're, you're getting a little taste of how I got into this business. That's just bouncing balls, <laughs> uh, uh, classical balls in a, on an air track, bam, 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 bam. I didn't get this idea. What is that? What, what, what is the well, this is, of, of get idea? This is a, an ellipse was slightly uh, more, um, it, it, it involves the square root of the eigenvalues. Yeah. And that, that's uh, this one over here. Uh, just involve the eigenvalue. That's T. So, in a sense, this is the square root of this matrix. Oh. The M. Mm -hmm. Because you see, this this one connects the ellipse to a circle. Okay. Yeah. And this one connects the ellipse to ellipse. Mm -hmm. That is a neat thing to do. You do have to take my word for that. <laughs> This is, as I say, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this. It's a uh, it's saying that duality is right there. So that's one thing. Now here's another thing I want you to know about uh, eigen solutions that involves ellipses, and it's the reason for doing that. The eigenvalues of a matrix can be viewed as the stationary values of the quadratic form. We're just looking at a quadratic form. So what you're doing is you're saying, okay. Um, I've got this quadratic form. It's uh, quadratic in all of the 
of variables x, y, z, and however many I want to uh, have, and their product with every other one. So um, I'm talking about four things, x squared, y squared, x, y, and x, y. And so it's really three di different things. Uh, and I'm asking uh, if I make a constraint of normalization, that is, I say I, I want to look at uh, vectors uh, that are unit length, but I want to find where are the extreme values of the quadratic function of R as I try different R's. You see, and you can see the deal is if this is a, a valley, uh, a Hamiltonian, okay, a quadratic valley, okay, uh, it's a bunch of ellipses for different topography. I start here at the bottom of the valley and go climbing up on the higher and higher altitudes. These are altitude lines on a, a topographical map. And I come up uh, to uh, a value here on the circle that I'm interested in the path. And I walk around this path and look for the highest values and the lowest values. The highest value is clearly there. I walk down the path to there. That's the lowest value and then back up to the highest value, you see. So the question is, how would you ever find those things? Uh, you know, by geometry. Those are our eigenvectors, uh, you see, of the uh, matrix L that's uh, making this uh, 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 thing up, okay? So uh, the deal is, if you ask where the min-max values of the quadratic subject to a constraint, as I said, a unit norm, which puts you on that path there, and you're asking for the extreme values of that, uh, you're asking for those values where the curve just touches the constraint curve. You're asking where does uh, this thing uh, make a place where I can have a picnic. I can stop climbing down Right here, I'll be in the lowest point right there. I can set up my picnic bench without having a, uh, the wine tip over. And then uh, I can continue on the path and walk back up to the high point over here. I can again set my picnic bench down and the wine will not tip over. I, I'm flat, you see. But I have to work along here. I have to climb here and then I can I gotta try not to fall down like, as I go down to here and so forth, you see. So, those are eigenvectors, plus and minus the eigenvectors, you see. Uh, here we get two for the price of one. And Lagrange says such points have a gradient vector of the quadratic form that is collinear with the gradient of the constraint. And that value is the eigenvalue. Again, okay, I might have one. That's what turns out. The eigenvalue of L is L, L in this case. And that's something we'll, we'll show that uh, uh, later on as well. Yeah. But I just wanted you to see, this is the uh, process called Lagrange multiplying. You see, this is a connection between Lagrange multiplies. And why is it always our eigenvalues are called lambda in most of the books? I swear it's because of Lagrange. <laughs> okay? But most people don't talk, point this out. You see, this is, this is really, you know, something. And it's, it's multi-dimensional, you see. This is just two. So, so you are saying, uh, by the constraint, you are essentially enforcing uh, an Euclidean uh, sort of constraint. This, per, this would be true for any curve I wanted to do, you uh -huh. see, yes. but the circle is particularly important to us because that's our normalization condition. Uh -huh. Okay. You see. Yes. So this is a special case mm -hmm. of a more general situation where I could have any old curve in there and look for its uh, collinearity of gradients. And they would be extreme values. That would be the Lagrangian constraint that you're in. That's the method which should work in any number of dimensions, we would hope, right? Now, of course, the mathematician has spent years and years proving that you could do that with physicists and, of course, right? Sometimes physicists get tripped up by doing that. But in this case, they don't. It, it's right. Okay, so we're, we're just about ready. That's why I say uh, the uh, eigenvalue problem and the geometry of it. 
uh, is uh, is something that uh, we get. Now we got to do uh, this 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 uh, quadratic thing. It's called an expectation value. If you had angular momentum for L. All right. Let's get started here. Uh, matrix algebraic methods. Now we're talking about uh, how are we going to do this without knowing any geometry. We're just going to do algebra. And we want to find both the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors in whatever uh, order they come. We've been describing methods that might get the eigenvectors first and the eigenvalues second. This is going to do the reverse. So now we're going to use this matrix 1, 2, 3, 4, which I, I highly recommend to you if you have to teach this. Because its eigenvalues are integers. Easily remembered, as you'll see. Okay? So, we're after, uh, in the Dirac notation, uh, this matrix times some vector that just gives the vector back again uh, with some number that we haven't found yet. So basically you're asking if this matrix times uh, some vector xy uh, gives me the vector xy back again with a proportionality constant of some kind. So I write that this way. I just make it into one equation and try to solve that equation just using inverse of a matrix. That's what we're going to do. Okay? So here's the n by n thing. Here's the 2 by 2 thing. I'm just going to get old Cromer's rule out. Cromer's rule would be that I could find the x solution to this uh, equation by sticking in the inhomogeneous part, what physicists call this thing over here. Uh, for x, I put it in the first uh, 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 column. Okay, so if I had um, uh, 10 and 20 here, I put 10 and 20 right there. Now I put 0, and that makes me real worried. I don't know if I'm going to get anything but 0 out of this thing. And the same thing with the y. I, I go ahead and I put 10 and 20 here. That should give me the y. Now we have cleverer ways of doing um, inversion than this, but this is, you know, it's one that you can keep in your head for the qualifying exam. Uh, it's pretty nice. But the trouble with it is, oh, you get a zero. It, it, nobody's going to pay you for this, of course. Uh, X equals zero and Y equals zero is a solution to this. Any matrix over here at all is going to give me zero, right? That, nobody's going to pay you for that. So that's not good. So you've got to somehow, you, you got to save yourself. And the only possibility is that these things are not zero is if the denominator is also zero. For the zero numerator, I'm dead unless, unless, possibly, possibly, if this thing is zero, I might get a non-zero result that would satisfy what we're after. Well, this is called the secular equation. Okay? This thing right here, determinant of that, determinant of that. And that comes out very nicely, 4 minus epsilon, 2 minus epsilon, okay, minus 1 times 3, all right? So far, so good, okay? So I got to add all, up, all that up. And I end up with a nice quadratic equation right here, okay? Now, this is something you should remember for qualifying exam. I don't want to go through this in the qualifying exam. I just want to write those numbers down, okay? This is always minus the trace of the matrix. So I look at my matrix here, 4 and 2 is the trace, minus 4 plus 2 minus 6 is the coefficient of the first one, and then the last term, I'm putting the things backwards, which I usually would call last, uh, is a determinant. 4 times 2 is 8, minus 3 is 5. Okay, so this is 8 right here. That's 4 times 2. Uh, let's see, what do I got there? Um, oh, the, the. oh, no, yeah, 8 minus 3 is 5. That, that's what it should be right there. So there's a following me written correctly. Okay? So don't forget that little formula. And then there's a formula for the cubics that uh, is worth knowing. So it's a diagonal minor sum. I'm usually not too hard. We'll go into that later. We've got bigger matrices over there that we need that for. Okay, but this is good enough. And what's cool is the roots of that thing are really neat. But anyway, here I'm just reminding you uh, what the general situation is. 
and uh, there I have it written again. The trace and the determinant uh, are what you're going to get for, and I'll we'll use that over and over again. It factors really nicely. The roots are one and five. Okay? And you, you want to teach with integers if you can. Right? You don't want to mess with decimals. You want to not get the arithmetic. And, and particularly now, American students, you know, they're, they're you know, going to be doing this on their thing and not worrying, listening to what you're saying, right? So you want to make it so that if they can add, uh, you know, third grade uh, stuff, uh, they're in business. Okay, so here's the deal. Now, this is where we're going to uh, state something that is obvious for matrices that have eigenvalues. But it's really pretty hard to prove for general, in general. As I say, this thing is obviously true if M is diagonal of somewhere. The diagonal means that you've made the matrix in a coordinate system where all the eigenvalues are there and nothing else. But to, 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 to say that that's obviously true is, in fact, circular logic. Uh, some faith will be needed at this point. We're not going to prove this in general. However, I will pay a good sum of money for an elegant proof of that. I have not found one. There, you know, it's, a, it's almost a quarter of a lecture but to, to prove this uh, so far. It should be instantaneous, but I don't have that. And for pathological matrices, which we'll talk about uh, on Thursday, ones that have degeneracy, it is possible uh, that uh, you really need the logic that I'm talking about. But here's the, the deal. The deal is that once you have the secular equation, in this case factored or unfactored, let's do the unfactored one first. The unfactored one is the eigenvalue squared minus six times the eigenvalue plus five should be zero. Hamilton's Cayley's uh, theorem is that you simply replace the eigenvalue by the matrix itself. So epsilon squared replaced by m squared, minus 6 epsilon is replaced by minus 6m, and 5 is replaced by the matrix to the zeroth power, which is the unit matrix. So I put 5 times the unit matrix minus 6 times the matrix uh, plus the square of the matrix, and I'm expecting this whole thing to add up to zero. That is the hamilton cayley theorem is that that will happen for all matrices, bar none, in the field of complex numbers, and even on beyond that. Okay, this is a really important result. This is a, the result upon which all of this new technology that I'm going to show you today is based. Theory of equations of matrices. Now, once you've done that, you can do this. You can take the hamilton cayley factored form, okay, that's this one right here that matches this one right here. The matrix minus eigenvalue 1 times the unit operator. That expression times the quantity matrix minus the eigenvalue number 2, which is 5, times a 1. So that is what we're going to work with. That is equal to 0. I mean a zero operator, a zero matrix. Okay, are you on the right page with me? Okay. And then I'm going to, one by one for the n by case, and we only have two things that are going to come out of the two by two, I'm going to pull one factor out and call it little p1. p standing for uh, projection operator. This is the way you make projection operator. Okay, so to make P1, I pull out the one that has eigenvalue 1 in it. To make P2, I pull out the one that had eigenvalue 2 in it. To make Pn, I pull out the last one, which is the one that had eigenvalue n in it. We're done after 2. To make P1, I pull out the one that had the eigenvalue 1 in it. I'm left with the one that has 5. And that gives me this. It gives me this matrix right here. That's a little P1 for us today. Little p2, okay, do the same thing. I leave in the one that has the first eigenvalue and I take out the one that has second eigenvalue 5. So I subtract a 1 from my matrix on the diagonal only. 
I get this many points. Okay? Now, why, why would you ever do a dumb thing like that? Okay? Now, well, and, and now, that we're not in Thursday yet, so we're going to assume that the eigenvalues are distinct. This is a non-degeneracy non clause of this argument. All of these eigenvalues have to be different, or we're in trouble at this point. Okay? Now, here's the deal. This is the bottom line. This is what makes it powerful. If I put back that factor, which means I multiply this thing by that thing I took out, I'm going to get zero. Right? So if I take pk, which is missing the factor with the eigenvalue k, and I put that factor back, I've got to recover this uh, secular uh, hamilton cayley uh, equation. I've got to recover zero. And therefore, the matrix times the little p is going to be the eigenvalue times the little p. You've discovered an eigen operator, an eigen matrix, you might say. And that's a projection operator. It's got to be normalized in a funny way, but it's going to satisfy the eigenvalue equation. And it's going to do it either way. We're going to get bras and cats out of this thing. Because M has to commute with this thing. Now, why is that? Why does M have to commute with the P? You know that matrices, if you make a random matrix, another, and they will not commute. You never find commutation if you just put down uh, two random matrices next to each other. But these do. And the idea is that M commutes with itself. This is equal to, and I'll write the second one first, and then this one. Okay? Now, what I really am saying is that m to any power commutes with m. Right? Inclu of course, including zero, but so forth, you see. Uh, I am guaranteed uh, that uh, I will never fail at this. And that's all I'm making these P's out of, is combinations, linear combinations of powers of M. So we are guaranteed that I could move this P to the other side, and it'll work there too. Okay? That means we're going to get both the bras and the kits. If I look at the uh, columns of these matrices, I'm seeing eigenvectors and I'm seeing an eigenvector here that's got a normalization of three. I've seen one here that has a normalization of, I'm sorry, uh, normalization that would be a three squared, and 18 for that one, and then one squared plus one squared is two for that one. But who cares about normalization yet? We're going to solve that another way. But right now we've got an eigenvector that is proportional, proportional to a normalized eigenvector. We'll define that later. Okay? All right. Now, what we really want is not just these lousy little P projectors. We want a big P. It's called the item book projectors. And then, once you do that, you, you, you can see how eigenvalues lead directly to eigenvectors with very little arithmetic. Now, item potent means that uh, an operator times itself gives itself back again. And that's what we, we're about uh, to get here. So this is continuing the thing with this example. Okay. So far we have these little p's, okay, and they're defined this way. pk would be defined as the product over all uh, possible eigenvalue indices, m, except the one that's uh, uh, being assigned to that little p. So it's dropped that factor, but every other factor is in there, okay. All the m's except k are in there, okay. And then pj comes up to this thing, and it goes and it multiplies this one, and then it multiplies the unit. So what you're seeing, you see, is an eigenvalue showing up. It's an eigen operator on the m. So you get an eigenvalue uh, right there with a pj, it's the epsilon j. And then when it hits this guy uh, down here, you get the pj with the epsilon m. So you can factor that out. Okay. 
Now, if it happens that J and K are e not equal, then you've reconstructed the hamilton cayley polynomial and then some. And anytime you re reconstruct it, you got a zero. Anything else you add onto that is still zero. Or multiply onto that is it still zero. So only when j is equal to k do I get a thing like this. It's not zero. It's a product over all m not equal to k. And j is not equal to k, okay, if that's j there, so I am guaranteed this is non-zero. So I can divide by that thing. That's my normalization. That's what we're after. So here are the little p's right here. You'll notice right away that they're orthogonal. So orthogonality of bras and kits has already been proved, uh, but we need to normalize. Okay, so we're going to make what we call idempotent projectors. I'm simply going to divide this factor out from the little p. So here's the new notation for the uh, little p, okay, m minus epsilon m, okay, uh, for all m not equal to k, it's index, and then this one is just k minus m. So basically you've got a pk here by writing down the eigenvalue k and then subtracting all the other eigenvalues in a, a sequence of n minus 1 uh, factors for n dimensional matrix. And here we have n equal 2, so we only have one uh, factor. This right here, big P1 and big P2, are the things that we had before divided by, in this case, 1 minus 5, makes it minus 4, you take the minus upstairs, get rid of it here and put it, uh, or get rid of it uh, here, put it there, okay? And then this is a positive 4, so I get just this matrix divided by 4, okay? And we need to plot those, see what they look like, and also check their properties. So this is the new uh, expression. This is the normalization of operators. This is what it looks like. It's very different from operation of states, but that's what's so elegant about this whole business. Is if you group, group theory is a theory of operators. Uh, states, I don't even know if states exist. Everything's always moving. It's always a transformation from one instant to another. So you might as well just get on the train and stay on it. If you try to jump off, you're going to get clobbered. So uh, the idea is that this matrix times PK is going to be eigenvalue times P. It's going to work backwards, just like it did before. Okay? Th th this implies this, because all I did was multiply a factor that's not zero and not infinite. And you can see a degeneracy kills me. Okay, well let's see what the uh, Ketz and Bras really look like. The first thing is a little tricky algebra. I like to take the square root of the uh, diagonal component and then uh, multiply everything there by the inverse of that and immediately get a Kronecker uh, Kett bra uh, product that we talked about at the end of uh, last lecture. That direct Kronecker or outer or circle cross product of these two vectors gives this operator. And that's Dirac's idea of a projection operator. But we've come around the back door and obtained it numerically a much quicker than he would have. You see, we've got the eigenvectors. He did. You have to go work those out somehow. Okay? So uh, here's this one, factor. Okay? Now I know I want you to notice something. I will not change any of these relations the idempotency, the eigenvalue, the orthonormality of the vectors that will come. If I put in a gauge factor, I call these scale factor, I put in a gauge scale factor, it only affects the plots. It does not affect any of the algebra. But uh, you will be free to stick in any value for the first eigenvalue, k1, and any value, k2, for, and then there will be n of these gauge uh, things that you can put on the bras and the kits and will not change their um, operational uh, properties at all because you'll always be canceling them out. What, why do you put them? What's the, is it the well, I'm, right now I'm just saying it's because I want to make my plants look nice. Uh -oh. Okay? But right now I'm going to keep them one. You'll see whether you want to. If you like that plot, then forget anything I said about gauge, right? some ideas for them. 
okay, that are quite uh, tangential uh, to what we're doing. I won't discuss that much. But here, here's what they look like, okay? Here is the eigenket, one half minus three halves, uh, down here, one half minus three halves. One half minus three halves for that one. That's our first customer, okay? Our second customer, I could probably say, is this one here. That's the ket that goes with the second eigenvalue, okay? Now, one of the things that you notice is because this is a screwy matrix, it's not a Hermitian, not symmetric, the eigenvectors are not orthogonal. But that's where the duality comes in. The bras make up for that. If you're thinking of uh, geometry of the differential kind, uh, this is going to be the, the contravariant vectors, the blue guys, and the red vectors are going to be the covariant ones. So that when I do a product of this thing in a scalar uh, form, I will get, I, I can arrange it so I get one. And I get that when I put the k's, uh, uh, anything I want, uh, I will get that. Okay? So, um, here is the um, basic idea of it. P2 is giving me this thing right here and giving me that. P1 is giving me this right here. Okay, that's recopied over here. All right. Complete with the gauge factors, you see. When you put them together, they cancel. Direct notation is still viable. Okay, but you will notice there's a right angle between the covariant, uh, or contravariant, whatever you call it, uh, epsilon number one, and epsilon number two of the contra, or go, vice versa. See, right angle here, and right angle there. And that has to be because of this. That's just reforming the hamilton cayley secular equation, which gives zero if they're not the same, and gives the operator if they are. Okay, so far so good. An elegant way to get eigenvectors and eigenvalues, and talk about them too. But we're only uh, swarming up here. As I said, the P are mutually orthonormal if you count the little broquettes that are inside the P's sitting, you see. Uh, here's epsilon 1, epsilon 1, right? There's the bras. We've done a lot of diagrams like this, right, when we were talking bras and kets. Now we're getting to see really what they are, and that when we do a scalar product matrix like that, we, we definitely get a, a 1. We have to, because we put in that uh, factors. Okay? Now, here is something, and we'll probably have time uh, today to discuss a proof of this, but it is really um, beautiful. The orthonormality we're taking care of, but here is the beginning of the completeness discussion. If you take uh, these two idempotent projectors and add them up, there's only two, so this is a complete addition of all the possible things this matrix can give us, I would get in the first component here one quarter plus three quarters, which is one. But I would notice here that I have a minus a quarter and a plus a quarter there, so I would get zero there. And I think you see where I'm going here. Uh, three quarters plus one quarter is one, so I have a ones on the diagonal and zero, that cancels, off diagonal. This will always happen. Not only that, but it will always happen if you pick random different numbers for the epsilons. This is more than true. That I'll come back to later. But let's just take what we've got for sure. This sums to one. Now that's Dirac's completeness relation, right? That we talked about before. That's axiom four for Feynman. And it says, do a complete sum don't leave anybody out. You leave anybody out, it's not going to be one. You've got to open all the windows in the analyzer and don't mess with them 
the beam will recombine the same as it went in. It'll come out. It'll be a unit operator. That's the physics of this. Okay. So there's wave interference in linear algebra and vice versa. Okay, we're ready to do the big deal. Spectral decompositions, functional spectral decompositions. All I have to do is take the completeness relation and multiply by the original matrix. So we started with m equal 1, 2, 3, 4. So I take my 1, 2, 3, 4, and I multiply it by the projection operator number 1, the projection operator number 2. That's all I've got. But each time I do that, I just get the eigenvalue times the original projector. That's cool. That's very cool. You see it happening right here. Okay? If I add up 1 times this guy, That's this guy, plus 5 times the number 2 guy, I get 1, 2, 3, 4. So that is a way to be able now to take any function of this matrix very quickly. Take any function of this thing that is defined at the eigenvalues and you're done. You want to take an exponential of it? Be my guest. Want to invert it? Put one over the eigenvalues. Now how does this work? The best way to see this is what I will use this to square a matrix. Say I want to make M squared. Okay? Well, M is a linear combination here of the, this number and this number and if I were to multiply n by itself, I would have to multiply this, well, the whole thing, if it was n by n, up by the whole thing. So I'd have n squared terms messing me up. At least it would look like that at first. Until you realize that the first term is p1 squared, which is p1. The second term is p1, p2, which is 0. The third term is p1, p3, which is 0. 0, 0, 0, 0, and then I come back to the diagonal, I get P2. So all I end up with is epsilon squared times P1 and epsilon 2 squared times P2, etc. So that's just the square. Cube, same thing. Fourth power, same thing. It's an analytic function, can be written uh, even. Uh, inverse powers, right, are available, you see. So anything that can be written as a power series can be solved QED in this way. Okay? So that's kind of nice. If I want to do the 50th power of this thing, I do not have to multiply it by itself 49 times. I simply go eigenvalue first and fit. Well, that's just one, so I write that thing down. And then I got a really big number here, 5 to the 50th power. So forget that. This is the answer. And that's a technique that's used to find eigen uh, solutions. You just take the matrix and multiply it by itself a crazy number of times, and whatever is left is the highest eigenvalue thing. Or you take the inverse of the matrix and find lowest. Right. Not something you want to do yourself on paper. But thank God for silicon. Mm. And, and uh, um, graphene, it's going to do it faster, right? <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> These are promises we shouldn't be making because it's uh, bad luck. You, you make them to uh, funding papers. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah, when the businessmen come around, uh, you know, we promise the world. <laughs> of course, we could get burned. Out. Square root of that's an interesting one, right? So I'll give you a couple little problems. You'll notice we have four different square roots, just for this little something thing. Because I can do plus and minus here independently, plus and minus there. Right? That's kind of 
the telling. Okay. All right. Now, uh, let's see if there's anything else. Well, I want to make sure that we connect this to direct. Okay. When we talk about uh, orthonormality, right? Uh, you know, the old x y instead of epsilon. You know, there, uh, we would we might write something like this, right? X direct y is a delta x y. Well, that probably mean a direct x y uh, right here because if I'm writing x's and y, that probably mean a continuum. So I'm already off in Banach space. But let's just say we have discretize it like you have to go in here anyway. So uh, I've got here uh, this thing uh, one x y, uh, which is a delta a Kronecker delta, and then I've got this sum here. You see uh, epsilon one epsilon 2, each of them sandwiched between an x and a y. The flip of that is the orthonormality, which looks like this, okay? That's what these, you see, this looks so different from this in algebra, right? This looks more similar, doesn't it? You can't hardly tell what's the difference, right? One of them's using x and y, the other is using epsilon eigenvectors, right? So orthonormality and completeness then become very obviously flips of each other, whereas those look very different. That's kind of cool. So the operator expressions for orthonormality are quite different expressions for completeness. Okay? Even if you use direct notation. Okay? It's when you put them back together to make wave functions that they start to look alike. Okay. It still is a little funny because I got these x's and y's here, and I got these things here that are uh, uh, even if it's an infinite uh, Hilbert space, I still got an infinite number of these things. Okay. But this is this is this, this one is very weird because you see this really would be a direct delta function if it was continuum. You want to play Banach, right? Well, everywhere we play Banach, we get in trouble. Hadron colliders <laughs> in trouble. They don't even really sure they have their Higgs bone on, right? They've got a theory that's stacked on top of parameters on top of parameters on top of parameters. It's a mess. They're doing field theory where infinities are everywhere. You've got to discretize. It looks like that's the only way out. So they invent strings and stuff like that, but that's just one way to do it, which doesn't seem to be working. In any case, there's that thing, then there's this thing. Okay? So this one's a sum or an integral, if it's continuous. Okay? An integral over x of psi well, i, psi j, and psi j star, psi i star. Okay? This Schrodinger uh, wave function notation. Uh, shows uh, quite a difference in, in that uh, last thing being but other than that they're quite symmetric now here's a, uh, coming back to something and we have time for this I think in fact I'm sure we've got a, another 10 minutes here uh, to complete uh, the hour 20 so um, let's compare the completeness relation and the functional decompositions that we've just done for matrices with, now here's Lagrange again. Isn't he a nice guy to come uh, visit us twice today? <laughs> okay, in ghost form, of course. Uh, Lagrange interpolation formula for a function of x for which you only know a discrete number of different points. Don't degeneracy a lot here. Okay, but you know its value at n points. So you've got this graph of the stock market. You go, get, do, do. Right now it's do, but it's about to do do and then do. Okay, so uh, what do you do? Well, if you've got n points, you might be able to make an n-degree polynomial or something like that out of it. Right? That's what Lagrange is doing here. Lagrange approximation of a function would be the function at those values. That's where you know it times this thing, which is exactly the form of the projection operator 
uh, that's going here and here. You see? The difference is instead of putting a matrix in here, you just put the integrator of x. And instead of putting eigenvalues, you're just putting down the points you know. Okay? So I'm going to give you a couple problems to just play with this um, later on. But it, it's something worth knowing about, it, you see. Each polynomial, Pm of x, has zeros at each point x equal xj. So if, you, if you've got every point except for k, you see, it's going to make that zero. Except where x is equal to xm, then we're talking about Pm here, then Pm of xm is exactly 1. So you see how it works. You sum over this thing, and this thing is zero and all the other points except for its own, where it's one. So, bingo, if you put x of k in here, you're exactly equal to that function. Nothing else is in a sum, right? All the others are zero by dint of the fact that this goes to zero for all the other x's. Pretty smart guy at Lagrange to think of, do something like that. Now it turns out that it's not a terribly useful uh, formula because polynomials, you know, tend to kink and fly away from where uh, a smooth curve would go. So uh, Fourier analysis and things like that are beat this, you know, terribly for uh, functions that are not um, uh, uh, too wavy. But you can, uh, of course, find more points and fix it and all that sort of things. So and sometimes it works. In any case, each polynomial term has zeros, except where that is, that's one, and then the L approximation is exact, as I said. Okay, so here's an example. Now this is the one that we want. This is the proof to the completeness relation. It's just that I'm using algebra down here, I'm using x's. And you'd say, well those are m's up there, matrices that don't commute, right? No, they commute with themselves. m squared times m is equal to m times m squared. Okay? So, we're done. This is true. It, it doesn't matter what the eigenvalues are. This is true. As long as they don't cross. They have to be non-degenerate. Remember, we had this non-degenerate clause here. Okay, well then x, okay, that's the spectral decomposition, you see. m equals well, a sum over eigenvalues times projection operator m. But then, we talked about the squared, the cubes, and so on. Any function uh, is, is okay here. So that, that's, that's kind of neat, you see. One point determines a constant level line. Two separate points uniquely determine a sloping line. Three points uniquely determine a parabola. You see? So if you're working with these kind of functions, the whole thing's exact. As long as you keep the numbers and everything in order. Okay? So this is a Lagrange interpolation for him being coming completeness relation as x approaches m and x approaches eigenvalues, provided you have the right number. Okay? All distinct values. Sum to one. Okay? So that's why I say completeness is truer than true. Now you can see that P1 plus P2 definitely true for all eigenvalues. Okay, I'm going to add this thing and this thing. Well, let's do it for two eigenvalues, like we've been working with. Okay? Bingo. One. The difference in eigenvalues cancels. Prove it for, for uh, three uh, dimensions. It, it, it covers about this much space if I were to go through the algebra of that. Prove it for four. It, the algebra gets bigger and bigger and bigger, but it still comes out the same. So that's the brute force proof of our completeness relation. Okay. Well, the rest of it's downhill. Let's uh, realize that once you've got this thing, uh, projectors of this matrix, 
it's pretty easy to simply use the bras and the kits to make a diagonalizing transformation and the other one that you need for the other side it takes care of the bras the inverse uh, diagonalizing transformation and this one will use the rows and this one use the columns but uh, you'll be able to uh, elegantly uh, rewrite uh, the original matrix uh, in terms of a diagonal um, in this case two by two uh, matrix is one and five showing up uh, on the uh, diagonal you see so this is just a technique you just simply realize that what I'm interested in uh, for bras is bra number one is the first row bra number two is the second row and that's got to be uh, on this side of the thing so this is really the diagonalizing transformation and this is its inverse over here the cats get to play uh, the inverse role okay. so the bookkeeping that Dirac invented is really powerful but we're doing it one better by making it very clear uh, what each of these uh, things means numerically so here's the detail now in this case uh, you see uh, it's not just a transpose you see th th if this were uh, a Hermitian operator this would be a um, unitary matrix it's not okay. but that's because this is screwy this, if this were Hermitian these would be unitary and the, the, the uh, diagonalization of a unitary operator is possible by this then the eigenvalues are all phases or a general complex matrix, then it would be a complex number for eigenvalues. And boy, you really need this when you play with those kind of things. So that's the uh, thing, you know, always check your results. Make sure uh, that the uh, DTRAN and the DTRAN inverse give you one. Uh, but you've probably already checked that already by just looking at orthonormality and uh, completeness. In standard quantum matrices, the inverse is easy this thing should be the star transpose of that thing. There's a little dagger indicating that. Uh, uh, yeah. Okay, now, um, the rest of this is uh, going to have to wait. I think we're just about at a point where we should uh, stop. I think we are uh, have another four minutes to answer questions. But uh, the thing that uh, we'll be looking at next time is when you put two of these or three of these things together, it's, um, you know, it would be pretty hard just to say, okay, now what do I got to do to stay here to make it through without getting changed from all of the, uh, of the uh, sequence of operators that I have. Really easy when you're talking about one analyzer. I can look inside there and say, it's got a path for x prime uh, and y prime, okay, or, or this one, this one really easy because it's x on the top and y polarization on the bottom. So I know x and y are eigenvectors of this thing. The idea is that you uh, have its own state as the state it's using in its separation process. It is separating anything that comes in here and sending the x part on the upstairs and the y part on the downstairs and then recombining it. Okay, and, and uh, if you're putting a phase on one of those, this won't be the same as that. But you can still be sure that no matter what phase I put upstairs or downstairs or both, the X is going to fly right through this thing because none of it's going to go here. It's all going to go on the top. It'll pick up that phase and it'll come back out again X. And then Y will come in and it'll all go downstairs. None of it will go up this way and it'll pick up the whatever phase that is, that's the eigen, second eigenvalue, and it will come out y. So with one analyzer, it's really trivial to find the eigenvectors. You just read them off the, the instructions for that uh, particular device. But put two of them together, oh, not so easy, right? So you multiply them and do this stuff, and you're in business, and that's what's going on here. And we'll talk about that uh, next time. So I will declare the end of this at this point, and we'll... Uh, answer any questions you have, embarrassing or otherwise. There are lots of embarrassing questions for that, but this one has relatively few. This is really tight.
And this is the way we're going to take groups apart. And it's the way they're taking the string theory groups apart. There's a huge book on group theory and string theory. And the first thing the guy does is he says, I've, ne I've never figured out where this, these spectral decompositions uh, came from, but I like Harder's presentation the best. And he shows this, this stuff. And then he, he sort of skips over. He doesn't really do it. He just says, you, you go look there. He, he just says, look, I've got a diagonal matrix and, and puts the, it shows the formulas right. But he doesn't try it. got other fish to fry, a lot of strings, a lot of strings they have to fry. <laughs>